Hello, and welcome back. Um, <clears throat> as you can probably tell, I am a little sick, and I wanted to wait to record the lectures until I cleared up. But sadly, that didn't happen, so you're just going to have to deal with maybe a, a little bit of <coughs> coffee <coughs> and um, not as much energy, but hopefully you can forgive me. Um, so this week, we get into the uh, darker, I mean, we've been some dark places already, of course, but the darker part of Israel's history. So we went through last week talking about the calling of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then um, that leading to the exodus from Egypt, and then finally um, the period of the founding of the kingdom and the temple. And uh, there we spent a lot of time on David. So we've been through a lot of the covenantal history of Israel. Now the exile is going to be very much um, keyed into this covenantal theology. And in fact, the, uh, the exile is really, in, uh, in, as it comes to be in Israel's understanding, about covenant. So it's important that we remember those, um, those things we had last week for this week. I know there's a lot of reading this week as well. Um, there's a lot of reading in the class period. I know that that's a struggle, or maybe not a struggle, but a challenge. I just encourage you to do your best with it. Um, the better, the more you can read and really think about, the better that you'll do. But um, again, it's the nature of an accelerated course. But um, hopefully these lectures help make the readings a little bit more understandable. Um, I don't know which order you tend to do them in. Um, generally speaking, it's probably better to... Uh, do the readings first and then watch the lectures, but there are times when it might be the other way around, and so I leave that up to you. Um, so we're in uh, the um, fifth act, the fifth great act now. Um, so we've gone through creation, fall, um, covenant, which is the calling of Abraham through the Exodus, and then we got um, kingdom. And now we're going into exile, and then of course we'll have redemption, reestablishment, and restoration coming up. And right now, like David and Solomon, we're talking about 9th or 10th century BC, um, so about a thousand years before Christ. And now we're going to move up through to um, the middle of the century. So... This is a world of kingdoms, and um, we talked a little bit about ancient empires in the um, lecture on David. I don't want to spend too much time here, because um, it'll probably really test my biblical history, um, since uh, that's, it's been a while since I did anything with that. Um, but there are two major empires that um, rise up in the first half of the millennia of the first millennia BC that are really important for Israel. One is Assyria, which uh, is uh, comes out of the capital um, uh, Nineveh, which is about right here. And Assyria is one of the first really, really big, great empires. Now there are empires before it, don't get me wrong. Um, Egypt, there was a previous empire of Babylon. Um, and you know the Sum Sumerians and and so forth, but this is this is a this is a one of the most uh, one of the biggest um, that the world has seen yet, and it's in the Fertile Crescent in this Middle Eastern territory, and it rises up in around the um, eighth century, and. Um, conquers all, much of the land, including a, a large part of Israel, as we'll talk about in the next lecture. But then in the 6th century BC, in seventh, some 7th and into the 6th century BC, remember BC goes, counts down, and then AD or BC, uh, so also BCE, which is before Common Era, that's the more politically correct way to say it now. So BCE counts down 
and then VC or, or excuse me CE common error or AD on on the uh, dominum counts forward right so when this the second century BC comes before the first century BC if that makes sense so in the seventh and the latter half of the seventh and in in the sixth century especially we see the rise of a new kingdom and that's the kingdom of Babylon um, this is of course a very famous kingdom Babylon um, the city of Babylon's right around in here where um, modern-day Baghdad would be and um, it was somewhat of a short-lived kingdom but it was um, significant while it lasted and it's during the Babylonian kingdom that the final um, the final land of Israel, the, the land remaining after the conquering of the Syrians, is finally captured and conquered. And this is what's called the Babylonian exile. And we'll talk more about what that means. But Babylon, um, right in the latter half of the 6th century, they kind of rise up. They were in the Assyrian Empire. And they start to look around and say, you know, we don't think that we have to uh, do what you say anymore we've got a lot of power we've got a lot of resources and we have we've got we've got guns not really but like swords and and we you know what Assyria we're not gonna pay you tribute anymore now one of the things as we talked about is when an, and when a when a empire conquers another city they um, will demand certain kinds of resources um, which can include troops can include actual like resources that are um, important or that are produced by that city and then most importantly there's tribute which is money I mean that's what it is it's basically enormous taxation and it's all under the auspices of, of protection right we protect you um, this is a great city It'd be a shame if something were to happen to it sort of thing I guess and so Babylon and so um, when it when a nation state or a city state excuse me says to this empire any empire we're not gonna pay you tribute anymore this is basically a formal revolt what they're saying is we don't have to do what you say anymore and we're ready to fight you if that's necessary and so that is really crucial so Babylon says we're not paying you tribute anymore Assyria and Assyria says oh is that right and then very quickly Assyria finds out that that is indeed right and uh, Babylon overthrows Assyria conquers most of it um, and then even down into Egypt and stuff areas that Assyria never got to and then um, you know builds these beautiful um, uh, uh, monuments and such so this is a depiction of the hanging garden gardens of Babylon one of the uh, wonders of the ancient world and um, so Babylon becomes really powerful but it's a very short-lived kingdom they're gonna last for a little bit and then um, Persia is gonna come along and so we'll talk more about that in a later lecture now an important th uh, thing that we need to understand aside from the context of kingdoms like what where what's actually kind of going on in the politics which I know is very broad stroke hopefully that's enough background to get us into the particulars of history of Israel's exile another thing that we need to talk about is um, prophets now prophets of course as you probably well you may know um, but if you don't now you will know prophets play an enormous role in in the history of Israel um, and they play uh, a role as symbols they play a role as historical personalities as people say like uh, Elijah and Elisha famous prophets and they um, are key to understanding the narrative so um, as we talked about the Tanakh or the Hebrew Bible is the Torah which is the law um, the Ketuvim um, which is the writings but the third and that's the middle one the end of Tanakh is the the Nevi'im and that's the prophets and so most of or not most of but a, a huge uh, portion of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament as the Christians call it is made up of this of these prophets you know and there's a bunch of them there's a, there's a ton of them um, and you have major prophets and minor prophets and these prophets generally write in poet poetic form not necessarily 
and um, they found schools that then carry on their writings and add to them and stuff like that. And so um, we need to understand what a prophet is. Now, especially because in today's language, you know, a prophet, of course, is a person who tells the future. Um, you know, you, you, you guess something is going to happen, it comes true, and someone says, man, you must be a prophet, you know. Um, that does happen. Um, and then another thing uh, that uh, prophets are understood to do is, is miracles. You know, prophets can do amazing things. That, too, does happen in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. But this is usually not the case. In fact, this is not the primary things. These are not the primary things that prophets do. Um, they do do this. They may tell the future. They may do miracles. They may not. There are prophets that don't do miracles that we know of. Um, and if you're wondering, like, can we really believe in miracles? Uh, we'll get to that when we get to Jesus. Um, I believe in miracles, but uh, we can talk more about that when we get to Jesus of Nazareth. But for now, um, they at least understand that in the biblical story, prophets <coughs> are understood to do miracles. But it's not um, what they do all the time. It's not primarily. It's not even a lot of it. They, miracles are pretty rare if you really kind of think about them in the Old Testament. They're pretty rare. Um, they don't happen all the time. It's just that as we read the Bible, we don't always, you know, register the many years or decades or centuries that are passing. But prophets may tell the future. Now, most of the time, though, when the prophet does tell the future, they're not prophesying about something way, 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 way in the future. Most of the time, they're talking about something that's going to happen within a generation or a few generations. And the biggest prophecy that, that kind of comes along um, in the prophetic literature is that, hey, Israel, you're going to be destroyed. Um, so it's not, don't think about prophets like, you know, or even the book of Revelation or something is like, these like, you know, kind of like prognosticators who are like walking around reading crystal balls and talking about, you know, helicopters and stuff in the future. Okay, that's not what they do. So what do prophets do? Well, strictly speaking, a prophet is someone who speaks for God. They are divine messengers. They are people who are anointed and sent by God to, to deliver a message. Okay? So... This is why in the prophetic literature, much of the time, you'll, it's, it's usually said from the point of view of God, Yahweh. And so this is why I often will say, thus saith the Lord, thus says the Lord. These are the words of the Lord. The Lord said these things. So most of the time, prophets are mouthpieces. Not most of the time, primarily all the time, but primarily prophets are mouthpieces to, to speak the divine word. And so, in a sense, prophets are a vehicle, really, for God to give messages to his people, to God's people, Israel. And one of the main themes that you'll see in the prophetic literature and in the prophets is this. This is an axiom I remember from undergrad. Um, I think it's pretty, I think it's a lot, uh, it's pretty common, but it's this notion of afflicting the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Um, afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted. And this has a lot to do with social justice. Um, most of the prophetic material, um, well, pretty much all of the prophetic material is criticizing Israel. Okay, prophets, the thing about prophets, there's even a passage, and I can't remember where, but they talk about, I don't want a prophet to come because they never say anything good. And it's kind of true. When you read the prophets, they never say like, and I foresee, you know, they don't never, but almost never do they say I foresee like some good stuff, unless they're talking about like the end of time or, you know, the looking forward to the reestablishment of Israel. But most of the time, what a prophet has to say is, hey, Israel, you're doing it wrong. And this has to do with two basic things, the law and social justice. And these are twin concepts. They're, they, you know, the law has social justice in it. We didn't get to get into that, but it's there. And so basically prophets come along and they say, Israel, you're not doing it right. You're doing it wrong. Stop it. Stop that. 
Practice the law as you are supposed to. And then stop oppressing poor people, the widow, the orphan, and the stranger, is this kind of um, formula that the Old Testament uses throughout to talk about the marginalized and the oppressed, the, the, the people that do not have advocates in society. And so it's a lot of it um, is aimed at um, the elite and the rich, and they're afflicted. If you don't stop this, we're, it's going to go bad for you, Israel. I will not continue to protect you if you continue not to break my, or you continue not to follow my covenant. If you're going to keep breaking my covenant, Israel, I, the Lord, am going to let bad things happen to you. You will no longer be under my protection as my sacred people because you won't follow the law. And in fact, a lot of times they'll use the language, especially like in, um, in Hosea, um, this language of marriage, you know, because remember also that the, the, the Ten Commandments was kind of a, a marriage covenant. It was kind of worded that way. Um, not, I mean, don't take that literally, obviously. But there is this kind of sense of, Israel, you will not be faithful to me. You keep breaking our covenant. You're worshiping other gods. You're not following the law. You're not taking care of the poor, the orphan, the widow, and the stranger, the foreigner. You're not being my people. You're not keeping the covenant. You're not acting like Yahweh's people, the people of God. And if you don't stop, things are going to go bad for you. And it actually ends up that things don't go, things end up not going, <laughs> things do end up going bad for Israel. And that's what we'll pick up next time.